All right, John chapter 20. And I know what some of you are thinking. I came to church last Easter and you read the same scripture. Well, we're kind of limited on Easter, you know. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? He's risen. John chapter 20, starting with the 19th verse. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> if you forgive anyone his sins, they're forgiven. If not, if you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I want you to remember that line right there. Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the question for today is, are you blessed? In other words, even though you haven't seen, do you believe? Because obviously, this happened over 2,000 years ago. We haven't seen it the way Thomas did. We haven't seen Jesus alive the way they did. Now, you may respond, yes, I do believe. I am a believer. And I want to suggest to you that there are different kinds of believers. I hope I can, if you are not already, I can convince you to be a committed believer before you leave here today. But let's talk about some other kinds. First of all, there's a casual believer. You know, basically, you don't follow Christ. You believe he lived. You may even believe he rose from the dead, but you aren't really a follower. You're more like a practical atheist. You say you believe, but you live as if there is no God. A survey was done in the United States. This was the question. Now, just think how you would answer this, okay? The Bible and the Christian faith claim that on the first Easter Sunday, the physical body of Jesus came back to life after being dead since his crucifixion on the previous Friday. Do you believe that Jesus literally rose from the dead? Okay? It might come as a surprise to you that 75% of Americans answered that question, yes. Do 75% of Americans live a committed life to Christ? Obviously, no. Yes, I believe that. But it really doesn't make much difference. You see, that's a casual faith. That's saying, yeah, I believe that. It has no impact on your life. Secondly, is a convenient faith. Now, if you have a convenient faith... You follow Jesus for what he can do for you. There's no service involved. There's no sacrifice involved. There's no giving involved. Now, this is not a new problem. Jesus had this problem. I'm always comforted by that, by the way. You know, as a preacher, as somebody who tries to persuade people and convince people what they need to do and to follow God, I comfort myself in the fact that Jesus himself failed more than he succeeded. Okay? More people walked away than actually followed him. John 6.66 says this, 
From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? The show was over. It was getting hard. It wasn't convenient to follow him anymore. There wasn't anything they could get out of it anymore. And so they went away. Enough on what we shouldn't be. I want to spend the rest of the time that you'll, that you'll give me the privilege of listening to me to talk about what we ought to be. And that is a committed believer. If you have a committed faith, you follow Christ no matter what. You know, it's kind of like when I got married. I promised to be true to my wife no matter what. Sickness and health, rich and poor, etc., etc., no matter what. No matter what. That's the kind of commitment we need to Christ. Jesus said this in Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So let's see what the road to committed faith is, okay? Let's go back to what Thomas said. Because sometimes real committed faith actually starts off with doubt. You know, God's not afraid of your doubts. He's not afraid of your questions. He understands. Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. Now, a lot of folks have heard of somebody being called a doubting Thomas and really never knowing where that comes from. This is the guy. He's the original doubting Thomas. See, you've said that, haven't you? you said, oh, he's a doubting Thomas. This is the guy. Okay. In John 23 and 9, we're told, 3 through 9, we're told that John saw and believed in the 8th verse. John didn't believe till he saw the empty tomb. Two other times, Thomas is mentioned in John's gospel. You know, it seems like this guy's kind of negative, pessimistic, gloomy. But it's also clear that he became extremely loyal and devoted to Jesus. In John eleven sixteen. 16... Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was going to do whatever it took. He was going to stick by Jesus no matter what. He wasn't like Peter. Remember what Peter did? Oh yeah, I'll die with you. And then he denies him three times. Thomas said, yeah, I will. Even if I have to die with you. John 14, 5. Thomas speaking again. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You know, I think Thomas wanted to believe in the resurrection, but he was afraid he would be disappointed. He wanted to be absolutely sure. He wanted absolute proof. You see, doubt is okay. And here's the reason. Honest doubts can lead us, lead us to a discovery. Verses 26 and 27. I already read this, but listen again. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came in and stood among them. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it in my sight. Stop doubting and believe. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. Do you have doubt? You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you truly try to discover God, you will find Him. If you haven't discovered this all to be true, it's because you haven't honestly tried. You've come up with every excuse in the world not to. So doubt can lead to spiritual discoveries. Those spiritual discoveries can lead to devotion. John 20, 28, Thomas said what? My Lord and my God. You know, Thomas, perhaps the most outrageous doubter listed in the Bible, okay, possibly made the greatest confession of Christ being risen from the dead. John's gospel starts out in chapter 1, verse 1, saying this, the word was God. Now, Thomas is declaring that Jesus is God. We're told at the end of the 20th chapter of John, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. 
Once Thomas got his proof, it changed his life. History and tradition tells us that Thomas traveled all the way to India preaching the gospel. Preaching that Christ was resurrected. And eventually he was martyred for what he believed. Thomas' faith, his committed faith, not his casual or convenient faith, his committed faith was enough that he died a martyr for Jesus. We aren't asked to do that. We're asked to live for him. So your committed faith, now, 2012, here in the United States of America, is evidenced by you living for him. If you don't, then all you have is either no faith, a casual faith, or a convenient faith. John 20, 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. So here's the question again. Are you blessed? Because you have not seen, and yet you believe. Now, Jesus is not saying that a subjective faith, which is one based on feelings, is better than objective faith, which is one that's based on facts. He's not talking about blind faith. He's talking about a satisfied faith. I have the proof I need. And I'm satisfied with that proof. It's a faith that doesn't demand visions and miracles and experiences. <coughs> First Peter 1.8 says this, Though you have not seen him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Either way, if we don't have a committed faith, then we are just playing church. And there are some folks who go through their whole life playing church. I went to church when I was a kid, I don't need to go now, I've heard it all before. If I go, if, I, if I'm a true believer in Christ, you know, I'll be the only one among my friends. And we start to line up the excuses. I went to church once and nobody said hi to me. You know how many Sundays that I come here and nobody says hi to me? <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's all right. I'm coming back next week anyway. <laughs> I know it's going to happen as soon as church is over now, too. <laughs> but here's the thing. A committed faith needs a personal response. You know what the name Thomas means? It means twin. Maybe you're Thomas's twin. We don't know who his twin was in the Bible, but it might be you. You might have doubts about the resurrection. That's all right. But here's the question. Will you seek the truth? Or are you going to live in your doubt? If you do believe in a resurrection, what kind of faith do you have? Casual, convenient, or is it committed? Are you a devoted follower of Jesus? Here's what you need to believe and be committed to. From Luke 24, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. From Matthew 28, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. From 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, useless, mere delusion. You are still in your sins. 1 Peter 1.3, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And from James 2.19, there are different kinds of faith. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. We're told in the Bible that... Uh, a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich guy. He had this 
really nice tomb carved out of rock. And we're told that he volunteered that place that he had prepared for himself. He said, let Jesus be buried there. And after the resurrection, somebody was talking to him and said, boy, Joseph, man, that was a big sacrifice. I know that tomb cost you a lot of money. That was a big sacrifice for you to give it up for Jesus. And Joseph responded, ah, it's no big deal. He just needed it for the weekend. <laughs> I don't know if you bought your final resting place yet or not. Like most people putting it off, but I want to tell you something. If you're a committed, true believer, it's only a temporary place. The Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise. The sea and the earth, everybody's going to give up their dead. Let's pray. Lord, I don't want to play church. I don't want to be a casual or convenient believer. I want to be truly committed. And I confess to you that I'm not perfect yet, but I'm better than I was last year, sir. I thank you that I'm part of a church where we help each other along and we don't shoot our wounded. <coughs> Doubts and questions are okay because we're helping each other find the truth. But I do know I have a satisfied evidence for me that what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life is true, and I don't doubt that anymore. 